First, may I thank Stephen genuinely for taking the trouble to come tonight. Gene Epstein asked lots of scientists to debate me on this topic. All but one turned him down. Sometimes I gather with insults about me thrown in. With 28 million people dead and the world turned upside down, possibly as a result of human error, scientists do, I think, have an obligation to join the debate. I'm glad Stephen agrees. Who am I to have a go at answering this question? I have a PhD in evolutionary biology from Oxford, an honorary degree from Cold Spring Harbor. Uh, I'm fellowship of the Academy of Medical Sciences and 40 years experience of writing about science, including as a columnist for three major English speaking newspapers. Plus I've written books on genetics and molecular biology. But it would not matter if I had zero expertise in biology. We all caught this vile virus. We all suffered bereavement in the pandemic. We're all entitled to investigate this question. Scientists who do experiment that potentially put us at risk cannot expect to tell the rest of us to stay in your lane. I'm a fan of science. I think it's humanity's greatest achievement bar none. I'm pro-vaccines, pro-biotech, almost obsessively pro-GMOs. Just ask my colleagues in the House of Lords how, on I, how long, often I used to go on about them. But if we don't investigate and own up to mistakes, we play into the hands of the anti-science crowd. I did not start out thinking COVID came from a lab. For the first few months of 2020, I went around telling colleagues that it, we could rule that out, mainly because I'd read a paper called Proximal Origin, which dismissed a lab leak as highly implausible. And I assumed that its five authors knew what they were talking about. Only later did I discover that I had been deceived. Not only did their arguments fall apart on closer inspection, but they did not believe them themselves. Here's what the five virologists who authored Pro Proximal Origin were saying to each other in private while they drafted a paper that ruled out a lab leak. Christian Anderson, I think the main thing still in my mind is that the lab escape version of this is so friggin' likely to have happened because they were already doing this type of work and the molecular data is fully consistent with that scenario. Robert Gary, it's not crackpot to suggest this could have happened given the gain of function research we know is happening. Ian Lipkin, given the scale of back coronavirus research pursued there and the site of emergence of the first human cases, we have a nightmare of circumstantial evidence to assess. Ed Holmes seems to have been pre-adapted for human spread from the get-go. Andrew Rambo, I literally swivel day by day thinking it is a lab escape or natural. They went on saying things like this even after the paper was published. So it's not that they changed their minds in the light of new evidence. A whole month after publication, Anderson wrote, I'm still not fully convinced that no culture was involved and we also can't fully rule out engineering. Now, writing a scientific paper that says the opposite of what you think is the truth is, I think, mis scientific misconduct. Why did they do this? Well, they made that clear, too. It was political. Andrew Rambo said, given the shit show that would happen if anyone serious accused the Chinese of even accidental release, my feeling is we should say that given there's no evidence of a specifically engineered virus, we cannot possibly distinguish between natural evolution and escape so we are content ascribing it to natural processes. And Christian Anderson replied, yup, I totally agree that that's a very reasonable conclusion, although I hate when politics is injected into science, but it's impossible not to, especially given the circumstances. It was political. So why have I gradually come round to the same conclusion that all of them did, in the, that the pandemic may have begun in a lab? Number one, well, 10 reasons. Number one, the outbreak began not just in one of the very few cities doing research on this kind of virus, but in the city with the biggest SARS-like virus research program in the world. It was described as the world's leading coronavirus ecology lab by none other than Stephen Goldstein. <laughs> but, but it's more than that. It's the world's leading SARS-like virus manipulation lab. These kinds of viruses are found a thousand miles away from Wuhan. That's a distance of Florida to New York. That's not the reason the lab was there. And we know of only one animal species that regularly traveled that route carrying viruses. That species was the scientist. 
They collected over 16,000 bat viruses all over southern China, Laos, and Southeast Asia, and brought them a long way north to Wuhan. The nine closest relatives of SARS-CoV-2 at the time of the outbreak were in the freezer of the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Now, coincidences do happen, but when foot and mouth broke out in 2007, just down the road from the world's reference lab for foot and mouth virus, people didn't think it was a coincidence. They investigated, and sure enough, they found it was a lab leak. In this case, they never even looked, or if they did, they never shared the results. Number two, the experiments they did there were crazily risky. They took the spike genes out of SARS-like viruses that they found in bats and inserted them into other virus backbones to make chimeras, then infected human cells and humanized mice. In one case, the chimera virus proved to be 10,000 times as infectious in terms of viral load in the mouse lungs and significantly more lethal. That's gain of function of concern. Why were they even doing this? ostensibly to predict which virus would cause the next pandemic. Well, that went well, didn't it? As Andrew Rambo put it, perhaps they had planned a press conference predicting which virus would cause the next pandemic, but then it escaped from the lab early. Number three, the work in Wuhan was being done in unsafe conditions. Biosafety level two for much of it. Don't take my word for it. The head of the lab, Xi Zhengli, said so explicitly. Her collaborator, Peter Daszak, boasted about it being highly cost-effective. Ralph Barrick called it irresponsible. Ian Lipkin called it unacceptable. Christian Anderson called it completely nuts. Francis Collins couldn't believe it, and Jeremy Farrer called it the Wild West. When biosafety was discussed at a meeting in London of the US National Academies and the UK Royal Society in 2015, the Wuhan Institute of Virology was singled out as the riskiest lab on the planet. When US diplomats toured the place in 2017, they expressed extreme alarm about the biosafety training. Number four, it's a coincidence of time as well as place. We now know, as we did not four years ago, from a grant renewal document, that the experiments they planned to do starting in 2019 were practically a blueprint for making SARS-CoV-2. They said they were switching focus from SARS-1 to viruses from southern China that are 10 to 25% different from SARS-1, i.e. like this one. They planned to introduce a thing called a furin cleavage site, potentially optimized for humans into the spike genes of SARS-like viruses for the first time at the so-called S1-S2 junction in the gene. Now that's a bit technical, but all you really need to know is that SARS-2 has this thing in it, and none of its relatives do, as you can see from my T-shirt. <laughs> that's the furin cleavage site. These are all the relatives. <laughs> SARS-2 is the first and only SARS-like virus out of many hundreds that have been described ever to show up with a furin cleavage site. And it's an insertion, not a mutation. And it's at the S1-S2 junction. And it's got codons, rare in viruses, but favored in humans. And we know from the D614G mutation that the furin cleavage site was almost certainly new in 2019. Number five, lab leaks happen all the time. There have been lab accidents that have caused outbreaks of influenza, anthrax, and many other pathogens. In 1977, there was a global influenza pandemic caused by a lab leak of an old strain. Hundreds of potentially dangerous lab leaks happen every year, according to Alison Young's research in the US alone. SARS-1 began, began as a market outbreak in 2002, but in 2003-04, it leaked from a lab at least four times, once in Singapore, once in Taiwan, and at least twice in Beijing, where it killed the mother of a researcher. In three of those cases, we still don't know how the accident happened. And there's way more virology going on now than there was then 20 years ago. So arguing that previous pandemics began naturally, therefore you should give natural theories the benefit of the doubt, is like saying no soldiers were killed by gunpowder in the Roman Empire, so we should assume people are being killed by swords and spears in Ukraine today. 
This is the first respiratory pandemic caused by a new virus in 100 years, and it's happened after a huge expansion of virology labs. Number six, there is no evidence at all that COVID started in the seafood market, none. Ralph Barrick, the world's leading coronavirologist, said so explicitly. People who say that those were the first cases, no chance. Stephen used to think so too. On the 15th of April 2020, it said it does not appear human infections began at the Huanan seafood market. Even the Chinese authorities, who blamed the market at first, have given up on that theory. George Gao, the head of China's CDC, has been saying since May 2020 that it did not start in the market because they found no infected animals, no antibodies in animals or people, no infected animal vendors, no infected handlers of wildlife food, no chain of upstream infection in suppliers, no multiple markets affected. Most of these things turned up very quickly for SARS and MERS and Nipah and other natural outbreaks. In one case which Stephen has reported on, they found MERS antibodies in 81% of the camels they tested. It's not hard to find viruses in intermediate hosts normally. For none of these signs to turn up at all, at a time when technology for detecting such things is far more sophisticated, that's bizarre. And yes, they looked. Despite a lot of talk about pangolins and raccoon dogs, it remains true that no animal with this virus or a 98% plus progenitor has ever been found from before the beginning of the human outbreak. Number seven, there were traces of the human version of the virus in the market, yes, but they were found only in people, where they were all the bee strain, and on inanimate objects, where they were also all the B strain, except for one possibly contaminated glove, which also had the A strain. Neither of these strains is the first strain to infect people. That's, there's now three different studies, all of which show that the earliest strains of the virus were not represented in the market. Now, Michael Warraby says that the positive samples in the market cluster in one corner where there were stalls selling wildlife. Well, yes, of course they do, because the authorities focused their testing on the stalls selling wildlife. Here's a quote from one of George Gow's papers. Shops selling wildlife, as well as shops linked to early cases, were prioritized for sampling. It's a true fact that there were traces of the virus in twice as many stalls that sold vegetables as sold wildlife. Warby says that the early ca human cases cluster around the market. Well, of course they do. The, ex the inclusion exclusion criteria for deciding if you had COVID in the early days were that you had to have a connection to the market or to have been treated in a hospital near the market. It's a circular argument. Number eight, the Wuhan Institute of Virology scientists behaved very suspiciously. They refuse to this day to share the database that they'd accumulated with 15,000 viruses in it, even though it would exonerate them in a flash if it does not contain a progenitor of SARS-2. They changed the name of the closest relative of SARS-2 at the time that was in their freezer, but did not admit to doing so. They implied they'd not sequenced that virus till 2020, then they had to admit they'd been working on it in 2018. They failed to tell the world that they had eight other similar viruses. When Xi Zheng Li published the genome of SARS-2 for the first time in two separate papers, she completely ignored the furin cleavage site. Those words don't appear. One of the diagrams is truncated just before the site would appear. As Alina Chan puts it, that's like describing a unicorn in detail, but not mentioning the horn. Western scientists, like the five I quoted earlier, were immediately alarmed by the furin cleavage site because they worried that it was a sign the virus might be man-made. Number nine, there's a whole bunch of suspicious events that happened in the fall of 2019 and the early months of 2020. They patented a device for dealing with animal bites. They ordered new ventilation equipment for the lab. They had a pep talk about lab safety. There was a coronavirus drill at the Wuhan airport. Three key lab workers fell ill with a respiratory disease. They patented a vaccine really quickly and the leader of the vaccine project died by falling off the roof of a building. They sent in the military to take over running the lab. Somebody quietly deleted a bunch of crucial genomic data from an international database. They banned the sale of ex-laboratory animals in markets. 
Now, these may not mean anything, and they may be coincidences, and some of them we cannot even confirm, but we know for sure that China offered an astonishing lack of transparency and cooperation of a kind that the world would not have tolerated from any other country. Number 10. The other side in this debate keep moving the goalposts. We'll never know what happened, they say, but we do know that it wasn't a lab leak. It's snakes, they say. No, it's pangolins. No, it's civets. No, it's raccoon dogs. Maybe it's frozen food. It's well adapted from the get-go, but it's suboptimal. The Chinese are not hiding anything about the lab, but they're, Chinese, they're hiding some things about the market. We know what viruses they had in the lab. We don't know, but we know it's of no relevance. We will find a furin cleavage site in a bat SARS-like virus, they say. Well, we didn't find one, but it doesn't matter. And so it goes on. What's the real motivation behind these excuses? Here's what Vincent Racaniello, a New York-based virologist, said. If a lab leak turned out to be true, that would bother the hell out of me, not just because of people dying and so forth, but it's kind of an indictment of the field, right? You'll hear from Stephen tonight that there is no evidence it was a lab leak, but you won't hear him finish the sentence. They never looked in the lab, or if they did, they never shared the results. I can present a deluge of evidence here today that would convince a jury on the balance of evidence. None of it proves conclusively that this thing started in a lab, but that is not what the motion requires me to do. Is it certain? No. Is it likely? You bet. Thank you.